Hello, and welcome back to Unexpected History. On December 7, 1941, a Japanese pilot crashed on a small Hawaiian island during the infamous sneak attack, the attack that brought the US into active participation in World War II, the most devastating conflict in human history. What occurred over the next six days is relatively unknown to most people, yet it is also the stuff of legend. Today, we examine the unexpected history of the Niihau incident. On that infamous day, Imperial Japanese Navy pilot Shigenori Nishikaichi was flying escort for some bomber aircraft from the carrier Shokaku, as part of the second attack wave to hit targets on Oahu, including the U.S. Naval Air Station on the Mokapu Peninsula and Bellows Army Airfield. As the planes made their return to the Japanese fleet, they were bounced by nine Curtis P-36 fighters. Although the American planes, already obsolete by this time, were defeated fairly easily by the vastly superior Japanese fighters, Nishikaichi's plane had taken a half dozen or so hits during the melee. At first, the damage seemed inconsequential. That soon proved wrong, as Nishikaichi noticed his fuel disappearing alarmingly fast. Before the attack, the Japanese Navy's intelligence believed Niihau Island was uninhabited, thus making it a safe place for any of their pilots to make emergency landings, should their aircraft be too damaged to make it back to the fleet. This belief was erroneous, as Niihau was privately owned since 1864, as it still is today, by the Robinson family, as well as having 136 mostly native Hawaiian residents. In 1941, the island was only accessible by boat, with the Robinson family's permission, which was nearly impossible to obtain, except for friends and relatives of the Niihauans. After Nishikaichi determined his fighter was too damaged to return to his carrier, the Harayu, he turned towards Niihau, crash landing in a field near Hawila Kaleahano, a native Hawaiian resident of the island. Although unaware of the devastating Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Kaleahano nevertheless knew that the American government's relationship with Japan was somewhat strained, to put it mildly, thanks to the Japanese Empire's expansionism and the subsequent U.S. oil embargo on Japan. Kaleahano thought it wise to confiscate Nishikaichi's weapon and papers before the stunned Japanese pilot came to his senses. A few Nihauan onlookers had gathered around the downed aircraft, wondering what was going on, as Kaleahano attempted to communicate with Nishikaichi, but the latter man's rudimentary English proved inadequate to the task. Kaleahano sent for Ishimatsu Shintani, a 60-year-old first-generation Japanese immigrant. When Shintani arrived, reluctant to get involved, he and the pilot had a brief conversation in Japanese, after which Shintani, who was visibly shaken according to witnesses, left the house without saying much, if anything, of importance. Confused, but still wishing to figure out how, and why, the pilot had managed to crash his plane on their tiny island. They next sent for Yoshio Harada, a Japanese man who had been born in Hawaii, and Harada's wife, Irene, who, like Shintani, was a first-generation Japanese immigrant to the island. The Haradas, together with Shintani, represented the entirety of Niihau's residents with Japanese ancestry. Yoshio Harada and Nishikaichi conversed in Japanese for quite a while. During that conversation, the pilot relayed the events leading up to his crashing on the island, including the attack on Pearl. Harada withheld most of the details from the islanders, especially about Pearl Harbor, as he believed, rightfully or wrongfully, that the Hawaiians thought of him and his wife as more Japanese than Hawaiian, although he expressed to them that Nishikaichi wished for his pistol and papers returned, a request which Kaleahano denied. The omissions began a series of events which would cost the Haradas everything, and help lead the U.S. into making egregious errors when dealing with Japanese Americans during the war. The Niihauans treated Nishikaichi with respect, even throwing a traditional Hawaiian luau, with him as the guest of honor. The pilot sang a Japanese song during the festivities while playing on a borrowed guitar. By all accounts, everyone got along well, despite the language barrier. That would soon change however, as the islanders learned about the attack later that evening via battery-operated radio. Nishikaichi was questioned again, and this time, Yoshio Harada faithfully and accurately translated, even about the attack. As the island's owner, Aimler Robinson, was scheduled to make his regular weekly trip to the island, the decision was made to have Nishikaichi return to Kauai with him. Unbeknownst to the Niihauans however, Robinson's trip was cancelled because there was a ban on boat traffic, put in place by the US military. When he failed to arrive, there was much confusion and concern among the islanders, as Robinson was normally very reliable. Over the next few days, as Robinson repeatedly failed to show up, the Haradas requested that Nishikaichi be permitted to stay with them, a request which was granted, with the stipulation that four guards accompany them. 
That arrangement would prove to be problematic, as it later turned out. Nishikaichi suspected Yoshio Harada's loyalties were wavering, and this gave the pilot a foothold to turn Harada, and to a lesser extent, his wife Irene. On the 12th of December, Ishimatsu Shintani privately met with Harawi Kaleahano in an attempt to buy Nishikaichi's belongings back. It was once again denied, but this time, Shintani left with a warning. There would be life and death trouble if the pilot's things were not returned to him. While Shintani was making the attempt however, Shigenori Nishikaichi and Yoshio Harada were not idle. They attacked and overpowered the lone guard on duty at the time, while Irene Harada played loud music on a phonograph to mask the sounds of the struggle. After locking the guard in a warehouse, the pilot reacquired his pistol, which had been stored there, as well as a shotgun for Harada. They set out for Kaleahano's house to retrieve Nishikaichi's papers, among which was a map detailing the attack and secret Japanese naval codes. The pilot desperately wanted to prevent them from ending up in the American military's possession. Along the way, they picked up a 16-year-old as a hostage. Fortuitously, Kaleahano was in his outhouse as they approached, and he witnessed them prodding their captive along at gunpoint. Staying hidden as they searched his house, Kaleahano made a break for freedom as they turned their attention to the down zero. Hearing the boom of the shotgun, which thankfully missed, spurred Kaleahano on to greater speed as he raced to the nearby village, wanting to warn the residents about what was happening and urge them to evacuate. Many residents were disbelieving, as the Haradas had been good friends and neighbors to them for nearly three years. In their minds, it wasn't possible for Harada to do the things Kaleahano told them. It was only when the captured guard made good his escape, and repeated an almost identical tale that the villagers would flee to nearby caves and dense thickets, while some made their way to beaches on the other side of the island, as far away as possible. Kaleahano and five others appropriated a boat and began to row to Kauai to apprise Alamer Robinson of the situation developing on Niihau. Alamer Robinson already knew there was trouble on Niihau, as the islanders had been flashing signals towards Kauai using kerosene lanterns and reflectors. He just didn't know what that trouble could be, and given the travel restrictions in place after the attack, he had no way of finding out, given the small island's complete lack of electricity, let alone telephones. As Kaleahano and the others rode towards Kauai, Nishikaichi and Harada remained busy. The pilot unsuccessfully attempted to make contact with the Imperial fleet. Whether this was because the fleet was beyond the range of the small radio, or the radio itself was too damaged to properly transmit is unknown. After failing to make contact, the pilot and Harada then forced one of their captives to aid them in removing at least one of the Zero's 7.7mm machine guns, along with some of its ammunition. That task accomplished, they set out for Kaleahano's residence once more. After another fruitless search for Kaleahano and Nishikaichi's belongings, they set Kaleahano's house aflame in a last-ditch effort to destroy the papers. Another Nihauan resident, and I apologize if I butcher his name, Kahikila Kalimahuluhulu, called Kalima by most, who had been taken captive earlier, persuaded Harada and Nishikaichi to allow him to search for Kaleahano, although this was a ruse. His intention, with the help of a friend, Benihakaka Kanahele, known as Ben, was to steal the machine guns and ammunition, after the two men made their way back using the cover of darkness. The morning of the 13th dawned with Harada and Nishikaichi capturing Kanahele and his wife, Kialoha, also known as Ella. They ordered Kanahele to find Kaleahano, and kept Ella as a hostage to ensure his continued cooperation. Kanahele was aware of Kaleahano's escape, but he pretended to search for him. He returned empty-handed however, more concerned with his wife's welfare than making a show of searching for the missing man. Unfortunately, Nishikaichi caught on to the deception. He angrily told Kanahele, through Harada, that he would kill every villager he could find, if Kaleahano wasn't found, and found soon. Fortunately for the islanders, the stress of the last few days brought about fatigue and discouragement in their captors, and Kanahele seized an opportunity to attack Nishikaichi, leaping at the pilot during a brief moment of inattention. The pilot managed to free an arm and draw his pistol during the struggle. As he fired however, Ella grabbed his arm, forcing it down and spoiling his aim. Harada separated her from Nishikaichi, who then shot her husband in the stomach, groin, and thigh, but Kanahele refused to go down. Though grievously wounded, Kanahele bodily picked up Nishikaichi and hurled him into a nearby stone wall, dazing him. Ella, enraged by her husband's injuries, cracked Nishikaichi's skull with a rock, even as her husband slit his throat with a hunting knife. Yoshio Harada, unaccustomed to this level of violence, initially looked on in silence, but as the Kanaheles turned towards him, he used the shotgun to kill himself. Kaleahano and the others reached Kauai after 15 long, back-breaking hours rowing from Niihau. 
Alamer Robinson had been trying for days to get permission to go to the island, but was repeatedly denied due to the travel restrictions. He knew, via the signals from the islanders, that there was trouble on Ni Hao, but what kind of trouble was unknown. When Kalehahano informed him of the events that occurred over the last few days, it was all Robinson needed to get permission to get a rescue mission organized. The rescue party reached Ni Hao on the 14th of December, just in time to save Ben Kanahele's life by taking him to a hospital on Kauai. Irene Harada and Ishimatsu Shintani were arrested, and interrogated about their involvement in the Ni Hao incident. The grieving Mrs. Harada maintained her innocence, and was imprisoned for 31 months, despite not being charged with any crimes relating to the incident, moving to Kauai after her release. She later stated in a 1992 interview that she felt sorry for Shigenori Nishikaichi, and only wanted to help him. Shintani was sent to an internment camp for the duration of the war, rejoining his family on Ni Hao after his release. He became a U.S. citizen in 1960. Benahakaka Kanahele recovered from his injuries, and was awarded a Purple Heart and the Medal for Merit for his actions during the incident, but his wife, Kialoha, received no official recognition for her role. The Ni Hao incident was cited at the time to legitimize the government's decision to intern about 120,000 people of Japanese descent, about two-thirds of whom were actually American citizens. Although usually cast as an expression of racism by the U.S. government, at the time, its implementation was couched as an attempt to lessen the risk that Japanese Americans were believed to pose to national security. Whether that belief was accurate or not cannot truly be said for certain, but in large part, the actions of the Haradas and Ishimatsu Shintani during the Niihau incident were taken as proof positive of the need for internment. Most of Hawaii's Japanese residents were spared the indignity of internment, as they comprised one-third of Hawaii's population, over 90% of carpenters, almost all of the transportation workers, and a substantial percentage of agricultural labor. The islands were under martial law however, making internment unnecessary. Today, the remains of Nishikaichi's Zero are on permanent display at the Pacific Aviation Museum Pearl Harbor on Ford Island. The Ni Hao incident is one of the lesser-known events surrounding the attack on Pearl Harbor. Although I consider myself a student of history, I knew nothing of this incident until I started researching the day of the attack. My own father, who knows more about World War II than most non-historians, didn't even know about it, which says quite a bit, if I'm honest. This event, to put it bluntly, is a prime example of why we started Unexpected History. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out with the YouTube algorithm. If you'd like to support what we do, you can visit our Patreon page for monthly membership options. If a monthly commitment isn't your thing, you can donate as little as $3 through our Buy Me A Coffee page. Or you can buy some of our merchandise. All links will be in the description below. In any case, we're glad you're here, and we'll see you in the next one.